an airport because that was a large lake at the end of the Ice Age. Um, and uh, around your area, it would be the Mississippi River area, the large creeks, or the large uh, streams, the large springs that are there, like Babbler Spring, would have attracted these Pleistocene animals. And where there's animals, there's people wanting to hunt them. And uh, the earliest points, spear points that they use, people are kind of amazed by, but those are the most delicate and the most carefully crafted of the, of the points. Um, uh, it's because a lot of their efforts went into killing animals were the main source of food at the time, being the Ice Age, so there wasn't a lot of plants. So you see a lot of their artistic uh, skills went into the projectile points. Now, this is, shows up at every museum where they're driving the big mastodons into the, river, into the muddy water. And supposed to be, people used to think that that would mire the animal down. Problem is, it mires the people down too, if they're in there. So I wouldn't want to be in the muddy water with a, uh, a wounded mastodon thrashing about. That's probably like that guy that you see at the upper right. Uh, he'd probably end up dead like him. Instead, what people did, they knew where the watering holes were and other places where these animals would congregate, and they would wait for them to show up. They would have two people watching the hunting, tr the, the trail that they would walk on, and while the other people would camp nearby, and once the animals showed up, then they would come out and hunt them. About uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, the environment changed, and it became warmer, more like we know of it today. That lake dried up, and you get the oak hickory forest here instead of the spruce cedar forest. And all the large animals died off, probably because of climate change, but also due to overhunting by the people because the horses and camels actually evolved here in the United States um, early, uh, earlier than, um, in, well, at first, and they actually traveled across the land bridge over into the old world where they survived until later times. Um, after this time period, we get a time period that's called archaic period, and it used to be people struck, they thought that people struggled and it was really rough to live at that time. It was probably more our archaic views of these people than what life was really like. They did hunt uh, deer and, and other animals using a spear thrower or an atlatl. And that's what you see the guy holding in his hand there. And that allows you to throw a spear further and with more power than if you do with your hand. Now, the problem is this picture shows them carrying like three or four or five spears. You wouldn't want to carry those long spears through the woods in this area. You'd be all tangled up. So instead, they only had one long spear, and then they had a bunch of smaller spear points that they had on a four shaft, and that would stick into the longer spear. When it hits the animal, that pops off, that the spear would actually pop off and fall on the ground, and they could run up and reload it again, sort of a prehistoric machine gun. And uh, you shoot as many times as you want that way. Uh, these people, things that people are called arrowheads, are really spear points. They're not uh, arrowheads. Uh, and they were used with that spear thrower. Uh, the real tiny little points that people call bird points are actually arrowheads. I wouldn't want to throw up. I wouldn't shoot one of those big spear tips out of a small arrow. It wouldn't go very far. Um, the first people in this area used, after the end of the Ice Age, used what we call a seasonal round, where they moved from one territory area in their territory to the next. Uh, based on the season and where the most resources were the, at that time. And then they would start that round again and start uh, all over again. Because of that, you, they had houses. They did, people always think they lived in caves and rock shelters. They did not live in caves and rock shelters. They lived in houses. Now these early homes were fairly small and difficult to, for us to find, but we can find the other pits and things that they dug. For instance, the fireplaces. That they dig. Anytime a person digs a hole in the ground, you change the color and the feel of that dirt so we're able to see it. And um, this is an example of a fire hearth. If you had a campfire and you, and you build it today, it would look like this right when it's done. And what it does is the campfire scorches the ground red. And so you know that somebody had built a campfire there. You can take the charcoal that, that's, that's, that, that the wood turns into after it's been burned and can date that and tell what type of tree they were using or whether they were taking rotten wood off the ground or whether they were cutting trees down to, to burn in their fires. Um, quite a bit you can tell by looking at these little fireplaces. 
since they're using a seasonal round, if you're at a nut processing place, or a place where you're gathering nuts, you don't want to carry your nut processing tools with you to a winter camp or a summer camp. You want to leave them there. And so what they would do, they would dig pits in the ground and, and cover them over, and that's where they would find, get their stuff when they need it when they returned. Uh, sometimes they would use rock shelters and caves as a place to store these goods for the next season. This is an example of, a, of a, actually a site not very far from you all that uh, uh, was, a store, it was a storage pit and it's got all the things you need to make a, a, a stone tool out of that. Sometimes you can find the food itself, the bones. This is uh, uh, 3,000 snails. They were about two inches in diameter. This is escargot day at this site. About 6,000 BC, they changed. It was, it was the height of the hypsothermal period. It was a warmer time. And so the, 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 the prairies expanded, uh, the rivers dropped, uh, and made mussels more available and fish more available. So you do see fish and mussels becoming more predominant. They also seem to have, uh, have, have and so, so instead of deer, you start to see actually more fish in their diet. Um, at this time, too, they developed tools to process foods, their preferred foods. One of the preferred foods was nuts. They weren't agricultural yet, so nuts was used for all the things you used for grains for, for making bread, for making foods, all that kind of thing. And so they, but instead of cracking a nut with a nutcracker, what they did was get these pits, fill them with water, drop in a hot rock to get it boiling. Then they would sit on the side on, a, on another stone, they would put about five or six or seven nuts, take a, another stone and crush them up and throw the shells and the nut meat, everything all together into these boiling pits. That would cause the nut oils to float to the top of the pit and you can scoop it off. Um, this is an example of what the nut oils look like. It looked like milk. Uh, the, the Europeans are always, that came here, were always trying to figure out what animal these people were milking. They couldn't figure it out. But, that this is just fat, high in fats and proteins from the nut oils. And uh, these were used uh, for a high energy drink, sort of the beginning of Gatorade. The, the nut meat would float in the middle of that watery solution. You take a strainer and scoop that out and put it on the side and you can mix it with your foods or, or eat it raw or, or you can make a, a, a bread out of it, a, a flour out of it. The nut shells would float to the bottom of the pit and they would collect those and use those and you actually find more burned nut shells in their fireplaces than you do wood at this time. Also about this time, you could build a campfire and cook foods, but they found a more efficient way of processing foods and they developed earth ovens. And this is an example of an earth oven where you dig a pit about two, three feet in the ground, you take limestone in this area, heat it up till it's red hot, put them in the pit, put turkey or deer or fish on top of that, cover it over with hot rocks, and then seal the whole thing over. And in the same amount of time it takes you to cook a turkey in a modern day oven, it comes out done and much juicier than it does in a conventional oven and with a nice smoky flavor. They would wrap the uh, meat with wild grape leaves and other kinds of leaves like that to keep the dirt and the ash off it, but they also gave it a fruity taste. Um, you also at this time you find these iron being collected and, and ex actually exchanged for, for, from place to place. And they look like they're necklaces or they're, some people think that they're used for catching animals with, but instead these were used for tying onto nets in order to catch fish. Uh, this is the more common way of catching fish with these long nets where you get three or four or five or six people and you walk out into the river or the ponds and then you move back in. And by the time you get in shore, you have thousands of fish in those nets. You put them over a smoky fire and it meets, then it preserves the meat. And you've got enough food in one morning's activities to, to live off of for months. So you see fish was number one for food, waterfowl was number two, and then deer was third. Deer was probably something like steak. They had it maybe once in a while. About 3,000 years ago, you start to see permanent villages and people starting to exchange goods over long distances. We used to think that was because the populations got too large and people had to uh, uh, live together in villages. Now we think it's just the opposite. Um, the economy was actually expanding, not declining at this time with all these special processing tools. And, get, and so what they would do, they would set up a village near where uh, 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 
good sources of chert, which is what you all have out there in Wildwood, good sources of chert, Burlington chert, which is used to make extremely sharp tools. And it was traded all over North America. You find it down in the, at the mouth of the Mississippi River at this time. A lead was traded, um, all, the, all these other things. And so people would set up permanent homes near those locations so they could take advantage of that trade and those goods. Um, this is one of the houses. Um, the house, all those circles you see around the edge aren't for posts, but they were for storage pits. The posts were actually on top of the ground. Um, this one uh, was actually an earth home. So they dug out a little shallow area and then the dirt on the top they would use with the poles for their homes. And then all those pits you see there are storage pits. Now they didn't have all those open at one time. They probably had one or two. And as they got old or started to collapse, they filled them in and dug another pit. So uh, this is, you can see, this is a good example of how, a, how this building was used for a long period of time. About 2,000 years ago, uh, they're starting to stay in place along that they start to establish cemeteries and burial mounds. And mounds were used as places to mark that it was an important village or to mark that uh, these people claimed the local resources. And it was also used to bury the elite members of the, of the villages. You see some people becoming more, having more, being more successful and having more power than everybody else and having more exotic goods with them. It's at this time, trading's going on all over North America. And so you get uh, marine shell beads, uh, copper from the Great Lakes coming down here, uh, bear claws, uh, fossilized shark's teeth from Florida, um, highly ornate pottery being produced at this time. So it's no different than people today going out and buying Italian shoes or uh, English suits or, or eating Russian caviar. This was the same thing going on at this time. It was just different objects, but they're used in the same way we use them today. And you see these uh, large market centers developing at this time. And these people uh, at the head of the markets gaining a lot of power and prestige. And th they wanted to flaunt that because that encouraged more people to come work for you, just like cities today encourage people to come work for them and to uh, make their economies even better over time. Oops. Um, some of uh, the pottery was interesting. You find this spoonbill duck effigy that was common from Ohio to Missouri to Minnesota. It's widely spread. And it probably like the Greeks where they put heroes and stories on their pottery. These people did the same thing. I wish we could find the story of the spoonbill duck. It's, it was a real popular one, evidently. Another thing that's common about 2000 years ago are what we call Casper the ghost images. And these are uh, look like sleeping people. And we're not certain if these are just dolls or if they're, they're like Kachina dolls from the Southwest, which were showing spirits or gods, or if they were, we, it's, it's more commonly believed that they were, had a form of ancestor worship, similar to what the Japanese have. And they were honoring their dead ancestors with these, remembering their dead ancestors with these kinds of things. Then around 1500 years ago, it all stops. The long distance trading stops, the big villages stop, and people start using just these uh, cord marked pottery, no longer decorated potteries. Um, there's no attempt to decorate them at all. Um, some people have compared this to the Dark Ages, which occur about the same time, about 300 AD. So it occurs about the same time here in the Americas. So they don't know if there's some kind of global thing going on or what. I think it's a social, change going on, where instead of, of people um, uh, flaunting their goods, it was sort of like a hippies movement or a socialist movement that, that occurred, where people are now honored or thought of being more important if they gave away more goods or if they didn't show these showy displays of affluence, affluence that they did before. This, uh, you notice this pot is different from the earlier ones, which had rounded bottoms or flat bottoms. This one has a conical shape. And you think, well, why would they do that? That'd be hard to stand up. Well, it would be hard to stand up, but the, because of its shape, you can get a more even distribution of heat on, the, on these vessels. So it's almost cooking like a Chinese wok. Food doesn't burn on the bottom as readily as it does in a flat bottom pot or a rounded pot. And so you can get, uh, uh, you can cook your foods more thoroughly and more, more quickly. It was at these times that people became full-fledged farmers. They did 
play with agricultural uh, goods from as early as 4,000 years ago when they started growing gourds. Uh, you know, gourd's not important for food. It's used more for a container. So it's, it's, uh, you do see a ch uh, the first agriculture products were actually for food. And then over time, they started bringing in some foods. Now, about 2,000 years ago, during that trading time, corn was introduced from Mexico into this area. Oops. But nobody wanted it. Instead, what they raised were uh, plants that are common weeds in our area today. Goosefoot, uh, knotweed, maygrass, and little barley. These plants, plants have a starchy seed on them, just like corn. And you could make them. What they did, they altered the seeds on these plants so that they were larger and had a thinner seed coat. Quinoa is one of those crops. I've been saying for years we should be growing these foods because they, they don't take fertilizer like our, our corn does, and you don't have to pamper it like corn. It grows around your houses all the time. And so it would be one of the easiest plants to grow. Even in an urban lot, a, a vacant lot, you could grow these plants. And, and, and it'd be, we've now found out that quinoa is actually very healthy for you. It has all the amino acids that your body needs. Now we still haven't figured out a way to tie it into our diet yet. And that's the one holdback and the prices on it haven't dropped yet. But you know, if you start making more and more of it, it could be used. I mean, you could use it for uh, ethanol as well, since it's storage starch. Um, about a thousand years ago, you start to see these small farmsteads become again big cities, and I mean big cities. Uh, Cahokia was at thirty thousand people, larger than London, England, at that same time, and St. Louis had a large mound group as well, with twenty-six mounds at its location and a big village surrounding it, which I'd love to find that. I know it still exists somewhere there, but nobody's been able to find any evidence of it as yet, but I'm sure it's buried beneath the city. This would be just north of the arch is at today. Um, we did look at the Dampier site, which is in Chesterfield Valley, and was one of those market centers. Um, when, this, when, the, when they put the levee in, they dug out this big borrow pit. Well, they forgot to do the archeology span first. And so the Army Corps made them do archaeology around the outer edges of the borrow pit. So we were only looking at a place of about uh, uh, 20 feet wide, maybe 30 feet wide. And out of it just came amazing things. Uh, we got these buildings here, which are square. Most houses at this time were rectangular shaped. And most of the storage pits and things like that are outside the homes, not inside of them. These had all the storage pits inside the houses, even had shelving inside these houses where you can find the evidence of the shelving. Turns And one of these produced 37 shell beads from marine shell beads from the Gulf of Mexico. What this is, is a market center. And so while they displayed their goods outside, their extra uh, goods they kept inside the building, and they also used it as a place to sleep at night and to cook foods at night. And so th that was the market center that we had there. We even found this kind of curious object. It's a deer vertebra that had an engraved image in it, and it's an engraved image of a snake. And if you notice the green color. The green color is because this was covered with copper. So they may have put that on as a template and then uh, incised that in image into the copper. I also found a temple. This L-shaped building was a, a temple where we found, uh, you can see the doorway, and then just inside was a large post. Now, it's strange, the post wasn't in the center of the building, so it didn't hold up the roof, and also next to it was an offering pit, which had a number of, of fish bones in it. So we thought, that's pretty strange. And so when you're getting ready to enter this building, and you come into the, uh, from the light of the outside to the darkness of the inside, what you'd be staring you back in the face is this statue of an image of one of their gods staring you back in the face. So you can see it was meant for, uh, it's all just like our churches are meant, the same way. This site also produced uh, five objects that are known as, as long-nosed god masks. Um, only 20 of these have been found in the country, and this one we had three. Uh, different mask that came from the same location. And this is what one was looked like that came from the St. Louis Mound group. It has these long nose, it's an image of a person with a, a feathered headdress and a long bird-like nose. 
And it's probably based on a myth of, of Longhorn who wore these kind of things in his ear. And he would trick, when he's playing games, he would trick, at the time, they thought Titans, just like the Greeks had argued that uh, human, it, gods had beaten Titans. This is the same sort of thing where they were taking on co Titans in competition. And uh, long-nosed god, a mask in his ear, would wink at him and, and distract him so they would lose. Well, it turned out the Titans finally won. They took Longhorn and, and divided his body into parts and put it in different parts of the world. And his sons came together, fought the Titans, beat them, and, and reassembled their father. So it's very similar to the Osiris story of the Egyptians. And it's again, we're meant to reflect that you have life and death and the closeness of families. Then we have this U-shaped building that was there. Uh, here's one in Chester, on the, on, the, uh, on the Missouri River Bluffs, again, very close to where you all are at, um, that had a U-shaped uh, uh, shape to it. And these were charnel houses where the dead were laid out. And then their bones, when their bones were left, they were gathered up and put in those boxes in the back, and they would be brought out for special activities. Um, but you notice they had a fire in this image. Of, we found a large fire right in, the, uh, right in the front of this place. One of the things that's interesting, when you're standing at the temp temple for the spring or fall equinox, the sun would appear to have rise, risen right out of the front end of that, of that building. So tying the image, the, the chiefs with the spirits of the gods and, and the sun. After this time period, for around some reason, about 1400, it's all gone. No, we have not found one prehistoric site dating to that time yet. And it's a real mystery as to where they all went, what happened to these people. They had the largest population in the country in this area. They had very rich and elaborate societies, and yet they all left it. The French, when they got here, kind of recorded this area as an open territory where tribes from all over would come and hunt and trap and gather plants, and then they would go back to their villages and other places. Nobody tried to stay here. When people tried to stay here, then these other groups would beat them up and they'd get out. So it's a real mystery why this area was abandoned during that time, until the coming of the French. And the French and the Americans started in this area. And most people assume, you know, why do archaeology on, on um, historic sites? We Don't history books tell us all about them? And one of the things we found out, history books just don't tell us near the picture of what people's lives were like in the past. And it's oftentimes wrong. And so working like crime scene investigators, you can see and be able to rewrite history and bring back the truth of some of these things. And this is our popular images of of how uh, uh, Holmes at the time with the spinning wheel and the gun over there and Daniel Boone, of course, they always depict Daniel Boone as wearing his coonskin hat. He hated coonskin hats. He thought that they were, uh, fur hats he thought were just, made his hat it, head itch and they were too hot. He hated them. Um, we looked at the D Daniel Boone home. Um, er out there they were saying that that stone house was built in a year and everybody was living in it right really quickly. Well, what we've seen in other places is that people build a log cabin and they stay in that log cabin for about five or 10 years until they get enough capital and money from the, having moved to this new area to build something fancier. And that's what I think happened here. And we did a survey outside the area and found a lot of early 1800s artifacts were in this location. And when we dug it, lo and behold, we did find a, this is a cellar underneath a kitchen of a building that was there. Uh, the fireplace is just up to the upper right there, and uh, uh, th th that was then attacked. And so the building probably looked like this. It's probably a tomb pin building with a central fireplace. On the other side of it, we found a large storage pit. And you see that the darker soil, again, the darker, th uh, these storage pits change. Whenever you dig a hole in the ground, you change the color and the feel of the dirt. So that darker circle is where the pit had been dug in the past. And then you just remove that darker fill, and this is what it looked like. What's interesting about this pit is that it's bell-shaped. It's very narrow on top and widens at the bottom. That is not a European storage pit. That is a Native American storage pit. And we knew that, know that Daniel Boone was captured by the Native Americans. And so either him or his sons learned how to build storage pits similar to them. And we're using it in their house to keep their furs in that end. Now, what type of plates did people have? Not pewter plates, not wooden plates, 
But English creamwares, even though the Americans were at odds with the English for most of this time, they loved their English dinner settings. So English creamwares, and a little bit later on, pearl wares were real popular. Uh, creamwares are called creamier wear because they had a cream color, and then pearl wear had a pearl color too. And then red wares, which were used before the, uh, uh, during the 1600s, were relegated to the kitchen and used for storage crocks and, and jugs. Sometimes you can find the food. And again, they didn't eat deer, they didn't eat a bear, but their main source of meat was hogs and hominy, corn mixed with lime. Um, Native Americans may have actually developed that technique, and that actually adds calcium to the corn, which is oftentimes a limiting nutrient in people's diet. But when Danny Boone came here, he was leading a herd of about over just over 50 hogs from his sons and him drove from Kentucky to St. Louis, to their new home in Missouri. Um, you can find, sometimes find the gun parts. They do have British flints and, and French flints that were there, but you also see that local shirts, the Burlington shirt like you all have in your area, was oftentimes used to make gun flints. And again, it was something that the Europeans learned from the Native Americans. We often think that it's one way thing that Native Americans got all the knowledge and everything from the Europeans and nothing went back, but it did. There was a lot of knowledge that went back and forth. After 1830, you get a whiteware vessel that becomes real popular. And, uh oh, momentary pause. Um, let's see here. Sorry about that. Just in case you forgot anything that happens. <laughs> So, I've been accused of actually doing these this fast. <laughs> so, white wares, this is the, probably the most common pattern for white wares, this blue shell edge pattern, which was painted blue on the outside edge of it. That was, you found, we found that at Daniel Boone home. You find that in the cities. Everybody was using that, that type of plate. And then the other common one is this sprig uh, pattern, which is floral design that was real common, painted on the vessels. But more popular were transfer prints, where you take, a, just like a printing press, you would, you would uh, decorate the pots, vessels with these things. Advantage of that is that you could have matching sets. And if you broke your tea saucer, well, then you could go buy another one that matched it. And they were really highly ornate, the pattern covering the, almost the whole vessel. And there was a lot of classical scenes, um, um, uh, 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 Chinese scenes. Uh, during the War of 1812, the British people were trying to get, the manufacturers were trying to get the uh, Americans to buy their goods. So they would put uh, English, uh, American soldiers kicking English soldiers' butts as they were walking by. So anything to keep the economy going in England at that time. Um, the Germans introduced stonewares into this area. Uh, stonewares were originally invented as an alternative to, uh, to dinner setting, but they were too heavy and thick, and so relic became relegated to the uh, kitchen. And these replaced redwares during about the 1830s, 1840s. After that time, the only place you'll find redwares are on flower, flower pots. Cemeteries. Everybody thinks that cemetery bodies have been moved. Every cemetery you go to, they move the bodies. This is the second Catholic burial ground in St. Louis City where the Shotos were buried and many of the other famous citizens of St. Louis. It was the main cemetery for the Catholics in St. Louis. Next to it is the Methodist Cemetery and the Presbyterian Cemetery. So there's thousands of people here. When we found this, not one body had been moved. All the headstones are gone, but none of the bodies had been moved. And some of the people there were very affluent, very rich, we could see. Um, you can see that going, when you got here, you can see the actual grave shafts, that, that little sort of hexagonal thing, that's a grave shaft that was dug for the grave. And then you put in your, the actual coffins were intact. Here we had excellent preservation and the coffins were in great shape. They'd collapsed, but they were in great shape. 
um, the bodies also were in great shape. They're still doing uh, things, writing in medical journals on the forensic information that they're learning from these bodies. One thing people don't realize though, is there's a lot of valuable cultural information that could come from these. At the time, this cemetery was set up in a grid pattern. Uh, you can see it's not a very nice grid pattern. Bodies are everywhere. I'm sure if you looked at the headstones at the top, they were in all nice, neat rows. But underneath the ground, they're kind of a little bit helter-skelter, somewhat of a grid, but not really. The grid pattern was based on St. Louis that was formed by the French and then the early Americans. And the Americans loved the idea of a grid because when you're starting this new country, this new United States, how do you have individual freedom but draw everybody together as one common goal? A grid was a perfect way. You could have the uh, grid allowed everybody equal access to the rivers, ex equal access to the cooling breezes or the sunlight. You've got the church at one corner and the bars at the other corners. Um, so this was a very equitable way of setting up the city. The cemetery just reflected that pattern. At this time, before this time, death was considered frightening. Uh, they thought if you had bread, it would mold if it was near a cemetery. But after 1800, they started to preach a new thing where the person who died was just a momentary parting, and then again, you'll see them again. And that's what was reflected in what we found here, is that it was, they were being buried in a burial gown, more like a nightgown than a burial shroud. And they were tied with, held together in the back by one, or one to three uh, buttons. Now, at this time, they did not bury goods with the people. The only goods you found with these were Catholic medallions, or some rosary beads. What's interesting about the rosary beads is that you have this set of five that comes down to the crucifix. Every rosary bead we found were broken at that midsection point. None of the crucifixes were found. So we don't, we, we don't know if that was just part of the burial ceremony where they gave it to the next living relative as an assurance that they would again meet together again, or if it was the sextants who was burying that, who was stealing the crucifixes and then selling them for rum on the side. Um, after the 1850s, you start to get, even in the middle of cities, you can find remains of, 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 of things intact. This one was interesting in that Cochrane Gardens had been, low income housing had been constructed in that area with buildings 12 stories high with basements in them. You would say, Phew, no chance of anything being intact here. Well, lo and behold, yes, we did. We found all kinds of cisterns, privies, all kinds of remains that were behind these the, uh, big buildings. This one pit, this rectangular, this rectangular one to the left, that was the only one that had been damaged. You can see that little brown area in the middle. That's where a sewer line to one of the housing complexes had been constructed right through the middle of that. But the Privy pit itself was intact, and it turned out to be an old one. It's a mid-1800s one that it was woodlined. Privies are great for archaeologists because that's where they dump garbage. And you can actually see they're like little time chests. So you can see sometimes you can actually associate garbage from an individual family at these locations. So they're really interesting looking at these privy pits. Uh, then you have stone lined, uh, brick lined, you have cisterns. Cisterns were used for running water off guttering off the home into these pits where they would store water and they would use that for cleaning and other uh, washing clothes. Sometimes they would even drink out of it. And then you have wells. Everybody didn't have a well. You had one block that would work for a three to five block area and everybody would have to walk to the well and carry the water back to their homes. St. Louis very early did have water, but most people did not go for it at that time. In the 1850s, um, uh, you see a change in the plates where they go from pure white plates instead of those highly ornate plates. Even though they produced them, nobody wanted them. They wanted pure white plates. And part of that was due to Victorian influence, where they, were, they thought that your environment, what you ate, your, what you, where you lived. For instance, the guy on the right lived in a good, clean life. He ate good, clean food. He exercised. The guy on the, uh, I'm sorry, the guy on the left. The guy on the right hung out in smoky bars and uh, pool halls, and he, and he did drinking, and it reflected in not only in, in, it reflected in his appearance as well. They thought you could spot criminals by appearance, and that's what this is a book, teaching people how to spot criminals by appearance alone. Um, 
it was just part of the Victorian ideas that if you, if, and so that's why having a pure white plate was so essential so that you could have pure wholesome food, that your food wasn't tainted or spoiled when you ate it. Um, smoking pipes, by 1860s, they no longer used clay pipes, but they used these small pipes made of meerschaum and, and uh, briar and uh, porcelain and red, red wares and that kind of thing. However, what we found is that even though you cannot find one of these pipes in any uh, catalog, uh, store catalog at the time, these pipes continue to be used, these clay pipes, all the way up until about the 1900s and into the 1900s. And that's something you, you just don't hear in history books is actually happening. Um, and then even the 1890s, you'd think, why? You know, we even got moving pictures by the, by the early 1900s. So why even bother with the 1890s and the 19, early 1900s? But again, the stories we hear are about the wars, they're about the wealthy families. What do we know about the common everyday folks' lives that lived in Wildwood or lived in St. Louis? And so looking at these places will tell us. These were a place where the Missouri Botanical Garden was going to, it was a parking lot and they were going to build their, their new uh, multimodal facility there. And uh, they had homes like these on it at one time, but those were all torn down. And in the back of the homes, you have these water closets. One of the privies were open on the bottom because they didn't want to, they wanted all the liquids to flow out. And so what you'd have is uh, these narrow spaces between homes, you'd have a privy right next to a water closet, or I'm sorry, right next to a cistern, or right next to your well. It's amazing to me anybody survived the 1800s. Um, St. Louis actually had ordinances. They thought that you, the vapors, the smells, were how you contracted diseases. And so they, St. Louis had rules that you could only clean out these privies at night and not in the height of summer when the smells would be disseminated or go further. So you could only do it during the winter months. And, um, and it was the way you got rid of the trash. You, but what they do with the privy fill, they would take them and then use them for fertilizer in the agricultural fields. So again, it doesn't surprise me there's all these diseases at the time. I'm just amazed anybody survived it at all. By the 1870s, they understood germ theory. And in 1880s, St. Louis started developing rules against these uh, privies and started demanding water closets. And the difference between a water closet and a privy is that it was brick lined all the way. Even the bottom was brick lined. And what you do, you run the guttering off your house and there would be one pipe on the right there that would come into this water closet and then a lower pipe on the left that would take it from there to the sewers which had massive sewers underneath all the city streets in St. Louis. Um, and so that would get rid of your liquid uh, waste. Now, solid waste couldn't go through there because they were afraid of it clogging up. And st people still use these as places to dump trash. They didn't have regular trash pickup. So this was the best way to get rid of trash. So if they did have a grate, or in this case, they had a brick blocking the, the, the lower pipe. In the eight, 1920s, you can see people became started putting in indoor toilets. And then what they did, they just put a pipe in between the, the, the lower pipe and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the sewer pipe that went to, so that they could have their indoor toilets in. The 1920s, they get very elaborate. And one of the things that's interesting, in the cities, you see these very ornate vessels with gold on them. People wanted that. But in the country, people wanted just plain white plates still. And I think what's going on in the countries, uh, people were living in near their friends and relatives. So to have a fancy gold covered plate would make you look too uppity. But in the cities, people were transplanted from their country backgrounds with their relatives and friends and, tried to step, and were trying to establish new friendships. And so by having these fancy plates, they could, they could gain new friends and new relatives and, and, and even impress their boss. Um, uh, you start to see commercially produced condiments at that time. Uh, uh, milk. Uh, milk was originally done in a big barrel, and then you'd go outside and they would dip the milk into your, your milk bug bucket. Uh, sometimes you got a little fly or leaves in there that, that fell into the milk barrel. But, uh, and that's when it came up in the 1900s with these uh, sanitized uh, milk bottles. Uh, soda. Soda was always real popular from the 1850s on. Beer bottles. Um, uh, by the 1880s, they learned that uh, 
uh, lect uh, lights of uh, sunlight would actually cause uh, the hops to get a skunky flavor to them. And so the Americans started making brown bottles to protect their bill. In Europe, they started using green bottles to protect. This was a site we dug, which had all these bottles, just thousands of bottles in it. We found at least 3,063 individual beer bottles in there. A lot of them had their crown caps, and they were not just one type of beer, but there are many different types. So it wasn't a wagon turned over. What happened? I think the revenuers got it. I think this was during Prohibition, and they were running an illegal speakeasy. One of the most popular drinks at the time was Vin Mariani. Uh, actors, politicians, even the Pope advertised for it, and have the Pope's image on an advertisement was really unusual at the time. And the Vin Mariotti was special because it was Bordeaux wine with six milligrams of cocaine. So it was, uh, it, it, it really invigorated you. Coke was meant as a alternative to Vin Mariani, a non-alcoholic version of Vin Mariani. Um, this is one that was sold in St. Louis, celery soda. Sounds innocent enough, sounds healthy enough. And it's got high levels of cocaine and caffeine. Um, then you get medicines, patent medicines that were coming up, commercially produced medicines at the time. And this one, again, celery, celery compound. Again, it cures a lot of things. Even Granny likes it. Turns out it's got celery root, hops, malt. Oh, not too bad. But then it's got cocaine and alcohol, 21% in it. Uh, Capudine. Uh, before bare aspirin was given up as part of the World War I reparations by the Germans, this was one of the more popular headache medicines. And it contained a 5% alcohol, caffeine, and antipyrene, which is a heart depressant. You could die if you had too much of this in you. Um, and then the one night cure cough syrup, it ha had chloroform, cannabis, and morphine. in it. So uh, no wonder people were feeling good. They weren't getting cured by anything. But it's interesting looking at these things with all the things people are throwing out for us to be taking. You know, it's kind of, it's a learning thing that you can, we can learn from that. How, you know, uh, you got to be careful and watch this. In 1906, the federal government stepped in and started doing rules. And from there until the 1970s, they had rules still going in um, to protect us from some of these fraudulent medicines. Um, that rich people tended to buy the medicines that would cure individual uh, disease. Poor people tended to get things like liquizone, which was sold by, on Lawrence Welk places until fairly late in time and it was supposed to cure all kinds of things. Again, it had absolutely nothing of value in it. It was mostly water, which is why I guess liquid zone was a good name for it. So it's these places that we study. It's not because we want the objects. The objects really don't tell us anything. It's what those objects reflect about human behavior and human ideas that are so important and so popular. And it can tell us, you know, how, what we are like today and how we do, all of our, we're all products of our past. And so you can see that this is just, uh, our, our, these objects we have are a reflection of what we think and what we do. And so we can um, uh, learn from some of these lessons. And that's really the real reason why we do archaeology. I thank you all. Thanks, Joe. And th thanks for the that brief uh, summary in the in the middle there that helped to uh, refresh our memories as we move through that. So uh, <laughs> yeah. thank you uh, uh, being so diligent about getting to us and uh, and doing this presentation. So okay, well thank you all, Mr. Chair. Yeah, are there any questions for Mr. Harrell? Oops, I, I this is Steve. I've got one or one comment that uh, helps clarify some things because my grandmother around the turn of the century before then grew up on uh, Missouri Avenue mm -hmm. and I was asking her about outhouses. We have an outhouse and she said well yeah but I said well, what in the city how did that work? He said well it was hooked up to the sewer and there was water flowing through it and now I see you know, your description of the water closet. I see now what she was talking about. Yeah, yeah, after 1880, they came up with that. What amazed me 
it went right into the local creeks and streams. St. Louis did not have a sanitary plant until 1970. Until then, it went straight to the rivers, which amazed, always amazed me it took that long. <laughs> Joe, that's you, where uh, the name, that's why we love River de Pair. That's why we like it, yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> so 1970, right? 1970, when they first had their first sanitary plant, yep. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. Yeah, it really is. Hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Just unmute and the floor is yours. Oh, this is Steve again. I've got uh, one question. In the Wildwood area, were there, did you, have you found any settlements here? I, Sounds like the closest one would have been down in the uh, Chesterfield Valley there. You have a large one right at the base of the bluffs right near Babbler. Well, actually right across at the edge of the bluff near Babbler, there's several large mounds, prehistoric mounds. It's actually on the National Register as a mound district. It goes from Chesterfield over into your guys' areas. Um, and uh, yeah, you've got several large plantations, and that's that slave cemetery thing that we looked at. You've got farmsteads. Uh, we looked at a freed African American's home. You got all kinds. You got all kinds of prehistoric sites too, because you got Burlington shirt there, and people from the earliest time on love that shirt because it can make such extremely. You can. It's the shirt is sharper than any metal tool that we have today. So, and very early time they they started going there, and about four thousand years ago they were trading it all over North North America. So there's actually quarry pits from prehistoric times. In, in Wildwood area. So yeah, there's quite a bit. Problem is there just hasn't been much archeological investigations there. So we don't know a whole lot. But yeah, there's definitely things there. You haven't found any mammoths in Wildwood no mammoths yet. yet. but I'm sure they're there. I would bet okay. they're there. <laughs> well, I keep my eyes out. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Joe. Mr. Chair, if I could ask a question. So Burlington Church, a good tool. How do they tool the tool, so to speak? What do they use? Burlington shirt? They, they, would, they would use Burlington shirt during the final stages because it was the same density as the stone. Early on, they would use what we call mounds gravel, and it's that yellow gravelly stone that you see in most of the creeks and things around here, and it's harder than, 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 than the shirt, and they would pound on that and uh, knock off flakes, making it. Thank you. And in the final stages, they would use deer antlers to sharpen them. Ah, There's plenty of those out here now. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Joe. Okay, thank you all. You have a good evening. Bye. Joe, stay healthy and safe. You oh, too. Wait, just a quick question, Joe, before you go. Are there any new proposed digs in the St. Louis County area that these anytime soon. Um, the only we just finished one at Jefferson Barracks. Uh, nothing near you right now. Like that, that I'm trying to fight with the city of Chesterfield to preserve that big prehistoric mound. I keep telling them you could draw people from over those those shops down there are no different than any store in England, France, or any place else in the world. They're all the same stores. You could draw people from around the world to that area if you highlighted that prehistoric village that you have there and protect it. They just want to put in subdivisions or, or commercial development. So they don't want to be bothered with the fact that they've got this prehistoric thing. That, and I'm sure there's a large burial ground out there someplace. So they're going to hit it. They've already hit some bodies when they put in their sewer lines in that area. So, and I've tried to get them excited about it and try and do something about it. Just, just no luck at all. And that's the thing, you know, it's, it doesn't have to, it, it costs, archaeology costs less than 1% of an overall construction project. It's always nothing. But the benefits can be long term. And, you know, we're still talking about that site. And it's been probably 10 years since we dug it. So 20 years, actually. So it's, 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 um, it's one of those things that you can really highlight your community and draw people to it in that way. And we have a sense of, social, of a civic uh, community pride as well. So no, unfortunately, nothing that's um, anywhere near you all, at least right now. Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you all. Okay. You have a great evening. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, we only got we got two other items uh, to talk about the publication of the final Wildwood written history book. Joe or uh, or Kathy want to talk about that? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Kathy's going to handle the update on the work program, so I've taken this one. Mr. Chair and members of the commission, first of all, thank you again for attending tonight. We sure appreciate it. And hopefully Mr. Harl's presentation was informative and enjoyable. It will count toward our training, which is one of our work program items as well. We do have a couple of other sessions scheduled for later this year. And so we'll let, give you more information about that as we move forward with the work program summary. As you know, 2020 was to be the conclusion of our history book. It would be the fifth and final chapter and would cover prehistory till 2020, plus a special section on the incorporation. Ms. Von Gruben has prepared four of the five chapters. Um, one was prepared by the Department of Planning. That was the prehistory. And the Department of Planning leaned very heavily on Mr. Harl for much of the information on the prehistory of this area. Ms. Von Gruben is completing the final components of the, the final chapter from 1991 to 2020. Then thereafter, she'll be doing some work on an index and bibliography all of which you authorize and contracts have been signed and completed. The Department of Planning is working on the incorporation chapter. The incorporation chapter is not complete. I apologize for that. There, the chapter is in a, a draft format. Um, the department had assistance from uh, a group of incorporators, uh, Sue Cullinane, who was on our city council and a liaison to this historic preservation commission, Ron Marcantano, the first elected mayor of the city of Wildwood, Dan Vogel, the city attorney for the first 10 years, and Marianne Simmons, who led many a fight against St. Louis County and the development policies in the area of Orville Road, Wild Horse Creek Road, et cetera. So, Ms. Von Gruben is much ahead of the department in terms of, the incorp in terms of completion of chapter, but as I say, we're getting very close. Joe, our, do, Joe yes. did you say that you're getting help from all those individuals now with this, this chapter you're writing? No, that has been completed. They have provided me uh, information. They have provided me several um, drafts of different components of the incorporation history. And my job was to kind of uh, tie those all together and uh, put a perspective to it consistent with what Ms. Von Grubens used in the other three chapters she's prepared plus the fourth one that's being completed. Well, that's an all-star list if you ask me. Well, certainly they were there from the very inception to its end and brought, I think a lot of different perspectives. For example, Ms. Simmons, she, as I mentioned, was a fixture down at St. Louis County, the government center during the mid 1980s through the incorporation, arguing against development proposals that certainly didn't respect the character of the area, nor took into account anything that, from an archeological perspective, an environmental perspective, et cetera. So yes, it was, there's some interesting information in there and hopefully uh, uh, Kathy and I and the department will do it justice in fine, kind of putting it all together. At our last meeting, several decisions were made by the commission. We have uh, discussed the publication of the book. And as you know, we're using a local firm in Chesterfield to edit and then print and publish. The direction was is that there be editing, but the content itself would not be significantly changed. And from that perspective, that has been passed on to the publishing company. Also at that last meeting, the commission 
requested that the book be changed in terms of format from its current kind of smaller size to a larger size to hopefully reduce the number of pages and ultimately uh, reduce the cost of publication associated with it. Minecraft Design, which has done all of the graphic work for the different chapters and the book cover as we progress from one to now four, it has, is under contract and will be undertaking that format change once the final versions of the chapters and text are complete. So we've made progress. To summarize, we have four of the chapters complete. Chapter, the chapter being written by Ms. Von Gruben is nearing completion. There's just a few things left for her to do. The incorporation chapter is lagging a bit, but there is a draft that's been completed. And we have our graphic designer and our publishing company, so to speak, under contract or ready to proceed. So the question becomes, and this is the point of the item being on the agenda tonight, is with the pandemic, there's not a certainty that we will be having a large event to celebrate the 25th anniversary in October. Not knowing how COVID-19, the coronavirus, will react since there is no vaccine, there is no widespread testing, there is no contract tracing, and there are just so many uncertainties. I say that in the context that from our publishing company, we generally need to have them a version sometime at the beginning of July. So I'll backtrack those dates for you. The company needs two months to print. So taking from basically the beginning of October, we need to have, they would need something just to print by the beginning of August. They need two weeks to edit. And the editing has to be of the final versions of the four completed chapters, the fifth chapter by Ms. Von Gruben, and the incorporation segment. So that takes us to basically to mid-July. But that's just the time frame. Remember, they have to have all the final versions to edit so that there is a proof that's available. Once, a, once the final chapters are completed and edited, then there's the process of getting that proof to all of you for your final review before it's submitted to the publisher to complete. And so I guess what I'm saying is between the pandemic some missed meetings on the part of the pandemic because of social gathering sizes. I don't think we're gonna make the October deadline for its publication and availability, even if we have a Celebrate Wildwood event. So I wanted to explain the circumstances. Probably a little graph would have helped in terms of the timeline, but this all just came to Kathy and I this week as we prepared the report and went through the different components. I believe that a book can still be published in 2020. I think for the most part, it's just trying to get it done now in, in the context of an October, an early October event. So that's the first part of it. I'd like to think we could have it done so it's available around the holiday season and then we could market it there as a, a gift since we are going to charge for the final version and the decision has been made to charge, I believe, $50, Kathy? I, I think it's gonna be dependent on what the um, printing costs are, but I think we'll be able to keep hopefully under the $50 mark, yes. That'd be preferable if we can. So I guess to update you, here in the short, here in a very short period of time, we hope to have a proof to you. That proof probably will not be available to you till July at the earliest. And that will basically put us outside the parameters of the publisher 
needing at least two months, if not a little extra to complete. So I guess I want to get your all's reaction. Uh, I don't know if there's well, if much we us, can do about it. But well, if you get us, if you get us something in, in mid July, we probably wouldn't at the earliest get something by August. So yeah, we're, we're off a little bit there. Uh, I don't think it's a problem if we still hit 2020. Uh, I don't think there's an issue with that. And even if we have a big event, and, and that's probably still no decisions have been made about that. So we could be shooting at a target that's not going to be there. So I say we just uh, proceed as, you know, as efficiently as we can to get the things reviewed and get it to the printer. And if we can, if we can get it by, uh, you know, within 2020 i think we're still doing doing okay but that's that's just my thought other thoughts well yeah. I, I think that something that has had this much work and and toil and aggravation and everything put into it that we ought to just do it right you know no sense in pushing it there's nothing magic about dates and it'll be ready when it's good and ready i think and uh, if it's ready for the holidays and we can mark it as a holiday, but then I think in, in 2021, it doesn't make any difference. The book's still going to be the same and it's still going to say the same uh, things about the history. And, and I think we can also market it in, in the spring and, and uh, you know, when people are, when we start having events, I think we'll be marketing that book for, for a couple of years. Uh, I think we ought to just take our time and do it right. Okay. I've got my oh, this is Steve. This, this is this is Steve. Uh, yeah, I've got a feeling if we have a celebrate Wildwood this year, it's probably going to be underwhelming. I don't think with people with masks and uh, I. I don't think it's what it, it usually is. And I think, if, yeah, if we don't worry about having the book for the Celebrate Wildwood, just have it this year. And then next year, if that's 2021, I think that will be combined, if we can combine our book with the 200th uh, anniversary of Missouri, I think that's, that would fit in quite well. So I get some thumbs up from Chris. <laughs> Pardon? It's the thumbs up from Chris. Okay. Mr. Scott, that's a very good point about the bicentennial. We could tag on to that since it is an endorsed project. Is that the correct term, Kathy? Yes, sir. And um, we'll be able to use the bicentennial logo um, on the printing and production of it as well. So yeah, it's a good tie-in. Good point, Mr. Scott. Thank you. So that brings up a that brings up a, a good question. Should we? I mean, if we can get that 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 logo on there, is that an added benefit of of the book to have that in there? So just shoot for the twenty twenty one. Well, uh, as you'll recall, we the history book has already been endorsed by the bicentennial commission. I don't know if we could. I don't know when the seal will be available or when we could start using that. I'll have to defer to Mrs. Arnett. Yeah, we have it and we can use it in the book, whether it's produced in 2020 or 2021. And that's good news. Yeah. Uh, Jan, you had a comment before? The Stevens. There we go. Uh, there you are. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Steve. I think going with 2021 would uh, make it more more bounce to the ounce or something like that. I, I think it would be a good parallel to the, the state's celebration. Thank you, ma'am. Paul, you need to unmute. Yeah. Joe or Lauren, any comments? I think we should just really market it as the city's number one endorsed 
entertainment during a quarantine. The perfect thing to read if it comes if you're in quarantining again, you know, in December, the, um, or the perfect stocking stocking stuffer, right? So yeah, we'll just spin it. Yeah, I think. I mean, I we publish some stuff through work, and whenever you're trying to rush stuff for no reason, it doesn't turn out as well as it needs to. I think it needs to take the right amount of time. There's no sense. There's plenty of adjustments everybody's doing. So you guys just keep doing what you're doing and you'll do great. Thank you. And again, and digital sorry. version as well. Was that, I can't remember, was that included in ebook? Okay. Perfect. And again, our intent isn't to drag our feet. And certainly I would argue that we haven't drug our feet, but I do apologize for the incorporation chapter not being at pace with Ms. Von Gruben's chapter, but we intend to kind of still use that October timeframe as our goal, so to speak, meaning that we're going to work hard to get the chapters complete, get the information to you, get the editing completed, and then the proof back so that once that's completed, we have the luxury then to just turn it over to the publisher and let them take their time frame from that point forward. So I will assure you, we're not going to sit back on this and we haven't on the first four chapters. It's just, again, the pandemic kind of uh, threw us a bit of a curve. So thank you for your understanding. I will also add that even if we were on time, there's still one big unknown and that's the printing company um, has been working three days a week during the pandemic. So they are likely behind or the time frame may be extended. We, she couldn't give me a specific if they'd be caught up or not because we don't have a timeline on when we'd give them the book exactly. So I think that that's another question mark that even if we scrambled and got it ready, the printer may have a delay with the pandemic. So. Well, I think our consensus to take, let's, let's, Take our time, get it done right, and let's uh, you know not procrastinate, but let's just get it done when we get it done, and and we'll see when that is this this uh, fall sometime. And Mr. Chair, I want to emphasize to you and the other members of the Historic Preservation Commission: no decision's been made on the Celebrate Wildwood event. Um, the only the cancellations the city has made in terms of events goes through basically mid July. And thereafter, we're just kind of wait and see like most of the rest of the region and the country. So I don't wanna send you off tonight thinking that it's canceled or it's not going to occur. We're just not sure right now. So thank you. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, sir. Thanks for that discussion. Uh, next item is the 2020 work program progress. Kathy. I will do that and I'm going to um, share my screen. So it's a little bit more exciting. <laughs> Give me one second here. Okay. Instead of me just rattling off um, 14, a 14 item list, I thought it'd be a little bit better that we can glance through them here. So um, again, with the pandemic and just life as it is right now, there are a few things that we haven't quite kicked off yet. So we have six of our 14 main items that are yet to be started. And the first one is some repairs to Old Pond School. As you'll recall, those are painting of trim boards and fascia and some other um, minor work there. Uh, the second is to start evaluating the um, group of properties. The next one's to add to our historical survey. That's one of our trainings. Um, Mr. Michael Allen will be um, speaking to the commission in July and he's the one, it's his firm, the Preservation Research um, Center that we have had do that in the past. So that'll be one um, we'll pick back up here in the next uh, month or two. The final historic community marker, we finally have great news on this one. This one is going to get completed in 2020. Um, that bridge breaks ground on Monday. And um, so when the, when the project is complete, hopefully at the end of summer, um, we'll be able to install our community marker there. 
then the next two are relative to historic route 66. The first is just overall promotion. Um, and then the second is the pocket park. Those are both just been on hold at the moment. Um, and then same with the master plan to um, discuss. And so we're have a proactive response to acceptance of donations instead of kind of reacting. Kathy, um, go ahead, may, I, may I interrupt? Please. And with the permission of the chair, in terms of the Route 66 pocket park, um, the department's kind of walled off um, a certain amount of funding for that in the hopes that 2020 we could get that started. I just wanted to let you know that we'll eventually write some, some type of a request for proposals or uh, solicit um, responses from certain design firms. Once we receive the responses to that invitation or RFP, those will be reviewed by the commission. So I just want to assure you that you'll have a role in the firm that ultimately is chosen to help us do that Route 66 park as best we can. Thank you, Mr. Chair and commission members, and thank you, Kathy. Thank you. So we have started more than half of our um, work program items. So I'll give you a brief update on each of those. The first is, as Joe just went through, is the history book. And I did actually just get a final draft from Ms. Von Gruben. Um, I actually got it yesterday and failed to send it on. So tomorrow um, I will send that all to you so you can take another um, final review of that. Uh, the 2020 points of interest map, the department has started the work on that and hopes to have that text to you at our June meeting. Um, the Bellevue Farms Project, as we noted in a previous update, there's a group of residents in the area that have formed a nonprofit called Friends of Bellevue. And they have done an exorbitant amount of work in a very short time out there in removal of invasive species. So they've partnered with the city. We've been um, hauling it off and providing them some, some tools and some other um, things to help them in that work. They also were successful in uh, applying for a grant from the Missouri Department of Conservation for $25,000. So um, that will last them for a few years and it goes to um, further removal of invasive species as well as some restoration work out there. So once they get a little further in the cleanup, that's another project that the department um, has some design work ready and will begin um, the adding the improvements to that park property. And that will come back to you all as well when we get to the next phases. Um, the Champions of History program is now what we're after our February meeting, kind of what we're calling what was our memorial policy. And we've um, after that great discussion in February, we've changed it to a recognition program that does not, you know, living or dead. Um, and so we're, the department is still working on drafting um, more of that policy and that'll be back to you all uh, pretty soon. The Essen Log Cabin is another that we've started and are at a bit of a pause. Um, we're working on the uh, public space next to City Hall and that has been kind of leading out in front in one of the locations that you all have um, mentioned that you really want to see if it can work. And so we've mentioned that to the, the park developer or planner, um, and we're working through the public input process and um, other things there. So we'd like to get a little more information on some of um, the parcels that you all have looked at, and we'll bring that one back to you soon as well. Bicentennial celebration, uh, the endorsed projects were mentioned. Celebrate Wildwood 2020 is endorsed as well as the history book. So that does give us use of their um, logo and um, slogans and things that we can use with their permission on our products and then they promote them as well. We also were working on the community legacies. As you'll recall, we sent out 15 letters to different um, organizations and property owners. We have gotten no response yet um, on any of those letters that we sent out and people being interested in pursuing a community legacy, but we will follow back up. Um, times have been a little crazy, as you all are aware, so we're going to follow up again as that um, as time passes on in that one. So we'll keep you up to date. Uh, the archiving of incorporation documents is moving ahead. Um, our staff member, Chris, is 
been making pretty good progress. Um, she said it takes her forever to feel like she makes a dent because it's all in this big bin and each little newspaper piece is pretty thin. So, but she is getting everything scanned in and indexed as well. So we are making progress. Um, and then after our February meeting, the Cone Park identification signage, the department has a little bit of work there to do some research on the MKT railroad signs and some design. Um, so that will be back as well. So finally, there are four items that are kind of ongoing. Um, public relations, we did have an article in the Spring Gazette. We've done some things on the website um, and in our e-newsletter. Social media, we've um, made a, a, a pretty good push and had some posts. We also, um, May is National Preservation Month, and so Missouri Preservation featured the Old Pond School in a social media post that got some good legs um, as well and had some, some good reach. So it was nice that they featured that and, and partnered with us on that one as well. Um, I'm happy to report that with the Mr. Harrell's presentation that we finally have our training launched. So we have three more. Um, we're rescheduling Ms. Fox, who's with um, the Wildwood Historical Society and will speak on one room schoolhouses, particularly Old Pond School. Um, she, as you'll recall, had the flu in February, so we're going to reschedule her, and she has yet to pick a date. Um, and then Mr. Allen is scheduled for July, and we'll have a Route 66 um, later in the year. So the final item is the, um, the two city projects. One is the Manchester Road Streetscape, with, um, so on historic Route 66. Good progress has been made there um, as less traffic with the pandemic. So they've kind of knuckled down on some of the road projects. But as you can see, if you drive up there, it's still, still has a ways to go, but there's a lot of um, all the curb cuts and things are, and sidewalks have been, um, are being installed. We're also getting ready to add a feature, some information on our website. A lot of the sidewalks are porous pavement. So um, it helps in meet our MSD requirements, but it looks a little different and it's a little unique. Um, so we're going to feature that to educate people a little bit about why it looks different and what porous pavement is and does. So that's kind of a, a nice addition on that project. And then finally, State Route 109 is almost finished. If it will ever quit raining, they could stripe it and we could almost be finished. But the, the um, tunnel under 109 and the trail around it is open. Um, and so they're just down to some final punch list items in the striping and then it'll all be open. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, the historic uh, layer doesn't look the same, does it? A little different. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. In terms of the training component, at our last meeting in February, I noted that the city had purchased a couple of Mrs. Fox books on one room schoolhouses, we still have those available. So if you like to purchase one, that's an option. If you just like to kind of borrow it, we can drop it in the mail and you could have it over the remainder of our stay at home and modified stay at home orders. And we'd be glad to send it your way if you'd like to peruse what she's written about one room schoolhouses. So yeah, thank I, I borrowed word one the last time when we were at the Bull Pond School and it was Pretty easy reading, so uh, I gotta get that. I thought it, well, I don't think I brought it back yet, but it's downstairs ready to go back. <laughs> well, again, if anybody would like a copy just to read, that's fine, we'll send it your way. We could drop it in the mail and you'll get it probably the next day. Okay, uh, any other comments from anybody? Uh, have any reviews going on? So matters for consideration. Let's see who who hasn't said anything for a while. Chris, you, oh, there's Lauren. Lauren wants to say something. I was just going to say I really enjoyed the lecture today, and I could I could do that all the time. So it was a good scheduling. He is the nicest fellow too. Uh, and we've called upon him on in the eleventh hour, and he's never uh, never failed Wildwood. So we we really appreciate Mr. Harlow. Okay. Okay. Well, next our next meeting theoretically is uh, June twenty fifth.
uh, Thursday at 6.30. Mr. Chair, Ms. Stevens had a comment. Okay. I just want to say okay. it's so good to be back with everyone at a distance, but we're back together. And that means a lot. So uh, we can make a little more progress that way. But I've missed yeah. everybody. Thank you. Yes, you too. Okay. Oh, I've, I've got a technical question. Uh, we're going on mute when we're not talking and we have to remember to press the button when we want to talk. Um, I noticed that Joe has earphones with a little speaker on the cord. Does that make the sound better? Should we use that instead of, I'm just talking into my iPad right now. Can somebody help me with that? Yeah, I, I mean, the headphones make a lot of difference. It makes it easier to hear for sure, especially if there's bad microphone feedback. Um, you still probably want to keep muting your mic so they don't pick up the ambient sound in the room. But the head I usually wear headphones for these, for sure. Okay, that's what – I've got them here. I could plug them in, but I had enough – I was scared enough just trying to get into this thing. <laughs> but next time, I'll try the earphones with it. Step, one step at a time. <laughs> your microphone sounds fine on your iPad, Mr. Scott. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you didn't hear my, but 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 uh, my daughter's dog was trying to get in the door, so you didn't hear that. But I'm like, get, get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, if there's no objection amongst the members, we'll go ahead and schedule our June meeting at the regular time. Just assuming that we'll do another Zoom platform. Okay. Sounds good. Is there any uh, any word on when uh, when face to face meetings are going to happen again? Have you been told anything? Uh, I have not been told anything with any certainty. I know that here shortly on June twenty second we'll have the changeover at City Council due to the municipal election on June second, and I know a lot of people like to have that meeting because you get to say thank you to the council members that are departing and you get to welcome the new ones. So I don't know if that's the date or not, but um, I'm just not sure. Okay. Well, we'll play it by ear. It's the most, it's the best we can do these yeah. days. And thank you all again for attending. We do appreciate it very much. Okay, I'll take a motion to uh, adjourn. I move to adjourn. Okay, Joe, and then a second, Jan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, we're adjourned. Have a great evening. Have a good one, everybody. Thank Stay healthy. Stay safe. Yeah. Travis and Kathy, could you stay on?